I'm Kelly Norton. I'm the tech lead for the Speed Tracer open source project. Um, now, before, um, before I get started in earnest, I just want to ask a quick question, which is, uh, how many people attended my talk by a similar name last year? Anyone? Oh, cool. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, a lot of people watched it on the web. Um, so um, I'm going to do things a, a little bit different this year. Last year, I talked about um, performance tips, and I told you what GWT, uh, all the tools in GWT do to help you make your apps faster. Um, this year, I'm going to do two things different. Uh, the first thing is I'm not just going to talk about GWT development. I'm actually going to broaden the scope a little bit and just talk about developing web front ends. Um, and the reason will be obvious to you as I go through this. So if you're writing your apps in JavaScript or Java, this talk will be of interest to you. Uh, the second thing is, instead of giving you uh, a bunch of tips uh, and, and telling you all the new things in GWT uh, to make your apps faster, instead I'm going to concentrate on this tool Speed Tracer. Um, the reasoning there is that I, I truly believe that uh, by showing you this tool, um, it actually encapsul uh, encapsulates more tips in it than I could possibly tell you about in an hour here on stage. Uh, and the, the secret is, as much of the stuff that I said last year um, came directly from Speed Tracer, which wasn't released at the time. However, if you absolutely are going to be demanding your money back if you don't get tips uh, about performance, uh, at least a day's worth, um, there's a lot to see and hear uh, at Google I.O., um, including a number of talks today in this room um, and a talk tomorrow. Uh, in fact, there's so much uh, going on performance-wise, I, I just took it upon myself to call it the secret front-end performance series. Um, one more uh, bit of administration. Uh, if you're interested in the live waving of this, uh, that is, uh, you want to take notes, um, have conversations, ask questions while this session is... Uh, Happening and after, uh, jot down that URL quickly um, and, uh, and join in the wave. <laughs> All right, let's get started. So told you what I'm not going to talk about. I told you what other people are going to talk about. Um, now let me actually tell you what I'm going to talk about. So um, the plan today is uh, first we're going to start. Uh, when I do a performance talk, I always like to start by justifying why performance matters. Now. It's kind of preaching to, to the choir, right? I mean, you're at a Google conference in a session about performance. Google has historically cared a lot about performance. But I, I'd like to simplify the argument a little bit and focus on one particular aspect of performance and applications. Uh, after we do that, hopefully I'll convince you, you'll stick around and I'll spend most of the time from there on out showing you Speed Tracer, um, giving you uh, a test drive, and then we'll actually, after that, jump into a few specific examples of scenarios that we've had to uh, tackle both internal and external to Google where we've actually used Speed Tracer uh, and found some of our own performance problems and fortunately fixed them. Uh, after that, you'll be so thrilled, you'll want to hear about new features. Of course, I'll tell you about those. And since we started a little bit early, hopefully we'll have time for even a, uh, a few extra questions. So first, let's actually tackle that question of why performance matters. Now, whenever you justify spending time on performance uh, in your web applications, there's always a lot of complex uh, reasons people give why it matters, why you should do it. To me, um, and, and they're all perfectly good. I'm, I'm sure they're great. They include math and you know, return on investment and everything. Um, but to me, it, it actually comes down to a very simple thing. Performance affects your users. Uh, I've always said performance is actually just a characteristic of usability. Now, I'm going to try to continue to convince you of this but I'm only going to use basically three bullet points from here on out with some, support, some supporting evidence, including some demos. <clears throat> so first bullet point, uh, performance affects your users simply because it affects your users' ability to actually use your applications. So to give you an example of this, get to the right window here. Oh, hey, my talk is starting. <clears throat> um, so, very simple game. You can play along at your seat. As a matter of fact, I gave you the URL because it's even harder for me doing it up here on stage with a trackpad, so I'm probably going to get some misleading uh, results as I try it here on stage. Um, very simple game. All you do, you grab the ball, you drop it in the hole, and it'll time you. However, as you go through each of these putting greens, I'm going to increase the amount of delay. So the first one, obviously, zero milliseconds delay. As you move the mouse, as you're dragging it, there's no delay, nothing to interfere with you. It seems easy. The, the ball stays right there with the mouse. But if I start adding additional delay, it not only takes me longer, but 
it actually feels more difficult. 100 milliseconds, it's, it's pretty difficult. Oh. So the question is, why is that? So how many people have heard of Fitts Law? Probably a number of you. This is usually the, the sort of HCI concept that tells us that we want to have big buttons and we want to have them close. It basically says it's exponentially easier to hit something that's big and close, which totally makes sense. Now, if you dig a little deeper into Fitts Law, uh, it's actually based on something called the uh, uh, deterministic iterative corrections model, which is a really fancy way of saying that the way this works is you need to take your mouse pointer and you need to put it over something. You look at the distance between where your mouse pointer is and where the button is and you tell your hand to go off in that direction. Well, your hand's not very intelligent on its own, so at some point you realize there's some error, uh, and so you correct for that. And then, it, so you change your direction a little bit, and then you correct again. And you do this in a series of smaller and smaller sub-movements until you finally get to your target, right? In fact, the series of smaller and smaller sub-movements is where that whole log term comes from in Fitts Law. Now, why does this apply to the golf? Well, if you think about it, uh, applying what I just described, when you introduce delay, what it means is every time you do one of those sub-movements, you're operating on out-of-date information. Um, so you, have, you can do two things. You can either slow down, which obviously is unpleasant, um, or uh, you can make a lot more of these small sub-movements. So net, the, uh, sort of the net effect is that you increase uh, one of the coefficients here, b, um, which is usually something varies from person to person, and it's also something that tends to get larger as people age. So the punchline for this whole thing is, by making your app slow, you actually make your users feel older. So, uh, Okay, so the other thing is, is uh, users are just amazingly sensitive to delays. Um, this is actually a demo that I showed last year, but I'm going to show it again, because many people told me it, it demonstrated sort of the threshold at which people started to see things. Because uh, it's often surprising if you do this series where you start ramping up delays, the point at which you actually start to notice. So. Let's go over this. Now, you've seen this interaction everywhere. I mean, it's all over the web. I simply mouse over some links, and the links highlight to support the fact that my mouse is now over them. I mean, we, we uh, refer to it as a hover, right? Now, the simple interaction that you find everywhere, what happens if I start adding delay to this? At what point are you going to notice? So obviously, at no delay, this thing's great. It feels good. If I come up at 25 milliseconds, it's, it's still keeping up. Not really a problem. You know, maybe if you're eagle-eyed in the front row, you can see something. If I come up to 50 milliseconds, I mean, it's clearly, you know, starting to lag, but it's not problematic. I mean, it doesn't, it has a little bit of a sluggishness feel. Uh, but if I go all the way up to 100 milliseconds, you know, I don't care if you were drinking this morning, um, or didn't drink this morning, sorry. This is sluggish. Uh, and, and you notice this. This app actually feels like it's not keeping up with you. It sort of breaks the metaphor of your action caused something to happen. Okay. Now, the last one is a surprising one, um, and that is that uh, the user's perception of quality in your application can actually change based on the performance alone. In fact, there's a surprising study that shows that not only can their perception of the quality of your application change, but actually the content contained in that uh, application or web page can actually change. They, uh, in fact, uh, and here's a link to the study, uh, they found that, uh, uh, or these researchers found that as they increased the amount of latency in loading a web page, users actually consistently rated the, the content of those web pages lower. Um, I'm, obviously, it would be very hard to demo this on stage. Um, so, bathroom reading if you want to grab the link. But, you know, those are fun demos and everything. If you're going to remember one thing about, um, about sort of the, why performance is important and sort of action items for making your apps uh, more performant, it's this one number. This is all you have to remember from this section. Just one single number, it's 100 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds is the amount of time that you as a developer have to block the UI event queue in the browser. That is to run code. So to make it more concrete, if you wire up a click handler, you have 100 milliseconds in that click handler and you have to return. If you set a timer, when that timer fires, you got 100 milliseconds. You can set another timer, when it fires, you get another 100 milliseconds. So um, 
If you follow this, then your, your apps are going to feel um, much snappier. Um, 100 milliseconds is not arbitrary. I mean, you saw it appear uh, earlier as I, uh, as I talked about the delay. 100 milliseconds is actually the limit at which humans start to stop seeing things as being instantaneous. So I say 100 milliseconds is the limit. Obviously, the average needs to be much lower. If you make all your events 100 milliseconds, it's going to look like that, uh, the uh, hover example that I showed you. So keep this number in mind. Uh, I'm going to make it easier for you because I'm going to show you a tool that actually has this number built right in. But 100 milliseconds really is the sort of takeaway from this section. So we're going to get into showing Speed Chaser, but first uh, I want to continue on this one number. It's 100 milliseconds. Why is it so hard to do things in 100 milliseconds? I mean, it seems so easy. There's, you know, one-tenth of a second. That's the time I have. But, but why is that so hard in browsers? Uh, well, the first thing is, is uh, people don't even measure. I mean, this is the, probably the number one reason. It's a simple fact. And, and why would they? It's very hard. I mean, if you think about it, you know, maybe I want to measure how much time it takes when I click on a button. But it's not just enough to measure how much time it took to do that click event. I really want to know how much time it took, you know, when I, you know, I called a method from that click handler, and I want to know how long that method took, and then I called another method. So before long, I have this whole framework for taking timings in my web app, which is just unwieldy, right? Um, the second thing is browsers, browsers are all event and callback based. Um, this, uh, this makes it very hard to know what's causing the problems. So you may see an animation stutter on application. You may you know, notice that a, when you clicked a button, it stayed uh, blue or you know, whatever the depressed color is too long. But it's really hard to know what caused that because in addition to handling the click event or running the animation, you may have a timer going off. There may be, network, there may be data coming back over the network and an XML HTTP request, and your handler ran for that. So it's really hard to, to cast blame on the one thing that's causing problems in your application. And the final thing is browsers are just really complex. Uh, they tend to have lots of nest, uh, nested subsystems that call each other uh, in sort of mutually recursive ways, extremely hard to reason about. And, and the more tricks that browser vendors use to make them faster, uh, it does make it faster, but it also makes it that much more predictable. So every time they make something lazy so that it only happens when you uh, when you uh, exercise a particular part of the UI, it becomes much harder to reason about what's going on. So we wanted to do something about this because, you know, if, if you've uh, followed along with us for very long in uh, Google Web Toolkit, we're all about writing fast apps. So we said, well, we'll build a tool. And we really want a tool that does two things. Um, it, one, it, it tells you what's going on. I said the number one reason is that no one ever times. Well, that's, you really should, should just have a tool that's timing for you all the time, that tells you how long it takes to do everything inside your application. Um, and when it's timing everything, why don't it go ahead and tell me what happened inside the browser? I mean, I have to start to understand you know, what the browser does so that I can make things faster. If I don't know which subsystem in the browser is causing me problems, I really don't know how to structure a fix, right? So uh, a tool should do, should do these two things. And this is, uh, this is where Speed Tracer came from. Um, so I'm going to actually spend, now I'm going to switch over to the browser, and I'm going to spend most of the time showing you Speed Tracer. Um, so let's start with an application you're, you're probably familiar with, hopefully, um, Google Calendar. You can see I have an extremely busy schedule this week. Um, and uh, we're just going to use this as an example application. I'm going to show you Speed Tracer. Uh, monitoring the performance in Calendar. Now, Calendar, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fast application. The engineers on Calendar have honed it, they've tweaked it, they've used tools like Speed Tracer, and they've made it fast. Um, but we're going to use it to, to sort of show things off. So I open Speed Tracer. Speed Tracer is a Chrome extension. And you'll see that I just, uh, to get it started, I just clicked on this button up here in the, in the uh, top of the browser Chrome. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to calendar here, and I'm just going to reload it so that we have something to look at, uh, and then I can describe what we're seeing. Go back into Speed Tracer. Um, as you probably expect, going left to right is time, a very common way to represent time. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to zoom out so that we can get a better view. Uh, and then sort of working from top to bottom, there's obviously a control bar at the top, which gives you things like zooming. You saw me just zoom all the way out so that I can see all the data. Uh, next is, and probably the most noticeable thing, is this graph called the sluggishness graph. 
Now, this sort of encapsulates that 100 milliseconds uh, that I told you about earlier. The sluggishness graph is intended to be really simple to use. That is, if your, uh, if your application causes the sluggishness graph to hit 100% at the top of the graph, then you're keeping the browser too busy, which basically means that you ran something longer than 100 milliseconds. And we even have little heuristics so that if you continually th run things that are even you know, some fraction of 100 milliseconds, you continue to sort of push up the sluggishness graph. The intent here is that you can very easily run it on your application, and it tells you when things are bad. Rather than giving you a whole dump of data, and then you go and analyze it, and you try to figure out where the slow part is, this actually tells you when it thinks something is not performing well. Obviously, if you keep, uh, if you keep the graph you know, low, well below 100 milliseconds, everything's, everything's wonderful. Um, so typically, the way you use this is you start, you look at your uh, application, and you, and you sort of watch the sluggishness graph looking for these peaks. Um, and they, uh, they shine uh, or stand out on the overview graph down below, which shows you the full timeline. Uh, once you find something of interest, and uh, this is about the only data we have from calendar right here in this region, I can simply uh, select directly on the sluggishness graph and zoom in. Uh, now, zooming in, uh, zooming in, we get uh, the full details of everything that happens. Uh, we list all the browser events that happen, the top-level events. So this can include, you know, everything from parsing HTML as you load up the, uh, you know, the, the main HTML page. It can be timers firing. Um, it even shows paints for when the browser decided to repaint the screen. Um, then if you dig deeper into those and expand one, you can see uh, that you get the full details of everything that happened during, the, uh, during this event. And like I said, browser subsystems tend to be very mutually recursive, so you see things like you know, layout being called recursively and uh, you know, parsing of HTML often causes scripts to run. These sort of things that are very hard to reason about, you sort of have them, you can see them uh, laid out in this uh, convenient event trace. Now, <clears throat> if, I then click on, uh, if I then click on one of the nodes in the tree, I can get even more details about exactly what happened. Uh, the details are specific to that type of event, so they often help you, particularly when one of these is very large, to find out exactly what's causing the problem. And I'm gonna show you uh, sort of a working example of that uh, soon. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things I wanna highlight is that, uh, is that many tools focus on sort of the loading of uh, your application when it first loads off your web server and sort of getting started fast. But that's really only a part of the story. What you really want uh, when you're building uh, interactive applications is you want something to continue to watch because um, it's not just the loading of your application. It has to continue to feel, to continue to, to not be sluggish, as uh, you know, we termed it here. So to, to just give you a, a sense of that real quick, um, if I go uh, back in the calendar, and I suspect that uh, I'll probably want to go for drinks later for a while. Um, now let's call that drinks. Um, go back to Speed Tracer. Now I'm going to use the zoom button again so I can see the whole timeline and I can find that new data that came in. Zoom out, I see that I have some new data over to the right here. I'm going to zoom into that. And, and basically the point is here, you, you saw that just as I got the data as the application was loaded, I can continue to get the data because this is, you know, Calendar is an AJAX style application because so it continues to run code and update and it's very interactive. So I can continue to monitor the application uh, as I use it, not just when I'm loading the page. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna jump back, uh, zoom out real quick and jump back in to talk about the next part. You've probably noticed a few of these top level events have uh, little green, uh, green, orange, and sometimes red indicators to the side. Uh, we call these hints. The, the idea here was that, you know, we do a lot of performance investigations with uh, Speed Tracer, and we often discover patterns. One, one I'm going to show you uh, in the next section. And it's nice to go ahead and, and sort of encapsulate uh, or identify these patterns and then build some rules to just point them out for you. Some of them, some of them are very simple. So in this case, this is simply an event that took just slightly over 100 milliseconds. But since it took over, took over 100 milliseconds, I want to sort of give you a light warning that says, hey, this kind of took a long time. It's a green, uh, it's a green uh, hint, so it's not really critical, but it's something you should know about. If it took even longer, uh, the thing would get more critical. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a number of uh, hints that have to do with the runtime of your application. Uh, and also on the network panel, which shows you all the network resources that they loaded over the network, it also shows you, uh, you know, uh, best practices here, for instance, uh, you know, caching of resources. Uh, so, you know, recommending that you, uh, that you increase, use the right headers for your uh,
cache policies for your resources so you don't always have to fetch them from the server. You also notice that now that I'm talking about the network view, uh, it's, it may be hard to see, but um, the network view is actually sort of uh, underlaid on the sluggishness view. Um, so you can kind of see them both at the same time. Um, the reason why we did this is because, you know, you always have these XML HTTP requests which are going off to the server, they're getting data, they're bringing them back, and you always run code as a result. If you used uh, Google Web Toolkit, you know, the, uh, when you do an RPC, you see this happen. You go and you uh, do something on the server and then something, uh, the request comes back and you run some code. And it's actually very handy to, handy to know exactly when the data came back from the network and then something ran in the browser. So we want to correlate things going on in the network with things that are happening inside the browser or you know, uh, inside your code. Okay, so the final thing I want to show you as part of sort of the run through of Speed Tracer is, you know, say, say we've used Speed Tracer, we've found, uh, you know, we've used it on our application, we've just found a performance problem. Now, it's really hard to talk about performance problems. You know, I can, I can send an email to my teammate and I can say, yeah, um, you know, when you push this button and then you do this and you resize this, it gets really slow, uh, and it seems like this is not updating. Um, and even if I had to communicate all the data in Speed Tracer, it would be really hard, right? I'd have to say, well, it's 32.4% layout, and it's 15% you know, uh, style recalculation. It's just not an efficient way to talk about these problems. What I would rather do is I would rather take what I have here, send it to my teammate, or, or post it on my, in our issue tracker system, um, and then have that person open it back up and look at what I was seeing. So, just, uh, so when we did Speed Tracer, we added the save load functionality. So I just hit, uh, hit save, and I save this just as I would a web page. Save that to my desktop. Uh, I send that to my teammate, and I say, hey, could you take a look at this? I, I don't really like the way um, this thing is performing. And let me switch back. So I then open up that file I just received by email. I click open monitor, uh, and we're right back to where we were. So, um, so my teammate can see exactly what I saw when I found the problem. So it's much easier to talk about performance problems when you do run into them. Close those out. All right. Okay, so that's sort, of the full, that's sort of the full tour of the Speed Tracer UI. That gives you a sense of, of how to use it at a high level. But now I want to dive a little deeper and take a couple of specific examples, uh, uh, scenarios where we've had to do a performance investigations on you know, internal Google applications and some external applications. Now I've simplified these examples because you know, if I didn't, we would spend you know, three hours just going, trying to explain to you the code of some of these applications. But I, hopefully it'll give you a flavor of the types of things you can find and the ways in which Speed Tracer uh, pinpoints the problem. So we're gonna start with uh, an example I like to call the mysterious case of too much layout. And this is one of my favorites to show because this is absolutely something we did not know about until we started looking at these applications at Speed Tracer. Um, I'll tell you that we originally ran into this problem uh, we're helping the AdWords front end team. Now as you can imagine, that team needs to display a lot of tables. They need to display tables with numbers in them and you, uh, in fact, many of them for uh, probably obvious reasons, you want to edit it. You want to edit the, the values. I don't think they're as powerful as this. You can't actually change the melting point of hydrogen, but you get the point. Um, so very simple, I, I've boiled it down to this simple part. I want to build a table, I want that table to be editable. So, and I'm gonna, let me close this window, just so I don't get confused. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open Speed Tracer as I talk. Make that full screen, and return here. Now I'm gonna clear this for a second and I'm gonna show you what uh, we originally saw uh, in their UI in the thing that had them distressed. So they had to build up this table. So when they did that, they hit run and you notice that that button stayed blue uh, for a little long and it was actually a, a little bit of delay there as it built up the table. You know, in this table, and if you style it even more, the performance gets worse. So let's, uh, let's actually look at it in Speed Tracer and confirm that it was probably a little longer than we wanted. In fact, it's about 431 milliseconds, which, you know, that's, that's well beyond the 100 milliseconds that we're aiming for. <clears throat> so, now, being engineers, and I am as guilty as uh, probably anyone, um, I knew what the problem was. There's no need to even look at it in a tool. I mean, we, we all knew what the problem was. Uh, we were sure of ourselves, 
And so let me show you what the code looked like to begin with. Very simple, this is just a part of it, right? When we built a cell for each one of these tables, uh, we, um, we created a cell, which, you know, just a, a, a TD element uh, in HTML speak. Um, then we created a span to put our text in. Um, we, needed the, uh, we needed the width of the, um, uh, of the cell because we wanted to have this hidden text box, right? So we wanted to put this there. We just wanted it to be there so we could just, you know, made it easy. We could just enable it and show it whenever someone clicked on the cell. And then, of course, we wired up the click handlers to show it. And, you know, when, when you leave the text box, we committed our changes. It was, you know, really simple. Um, but I was sure that the problem was, I mean, you hear all the time, it takes a long time to build up DOM elements, right? And here we are, we're building too many DOM elements. I built a hidden text box that I didn't even need. No need to even look at it in a tool. We know what the problem was. Let's just go ahead and fix it. So we fixed the code, and uh, by comparison, you'll see that all I did is I moved this text box inside the click event, right? So this, this should fix our problem. It was, it was wonderful. It only took a few minutes to fix it. And, uh, but surprisingly, when we tried it, it didn't seem much faster. Um, and, you know, looking at it in Speed Tracer, Sort of confirm, it did get a little faster, but certainly not below 100 milliseconds, which we were aiming for. Now, I was suddenly a lot less certain about what the problem was. Um, so, you know, and now let's, let's actually do the right thing and let's go back and look, um, let's go back and look at the original event in Speed Tracer and see what it actually says the problem is. So I'm gonna zoom out again and find that original event. We see the hump over here to, on the left of the graph. I'm gonna zoom into that hump. And this time, let's expand it. Okay, well, first of all, I'm looking at the breakdown, and it's clear that the problem here is we're doing too much layout. Um, and if I were not convinced by that, if I scroll down through what actually happened, there is no doubt that the problem is that I'm doing way too much layout. But, but that's interesting to know, but what do I do about that? I don't even know what caused the layout problem, right? I mean, I wouldn't even know how to fix that. Um, okay, well, let's, let's click on one and find out. I, I thought the problem was the, uh, the input box. Uh, if I then click on the, well, that's certainly not the line that I thought was the problem, right? So, um, okay, well, maybe that one was just a fluke. Maybe it's being caused by a variety of things. If I click on other of these, no, the, uh, the panel is unanimous. It looks like the problem is not what I thought it was, which is that it was taking me too long to build up all my UI. The problem is that I was somehow forcing the browser to do a bunch of layout. And so I'll explain in detail why, what's happening here, but before I do that, let's actually fix the problem. So, um, so here's where we were on the last step. I had moved everything inside my click handler so I could you know, build up my, uh, part of my UI lazily. Uh, I'm just going to move one line this time. I'm just going to move that width inside the click handler instead of, you know, go ahead and move it in with the building of the input element. Um, let's clear it and see what that does. Well, you can already tell it was a lot faster, right? Um, but if I switch back over to Speed Tracer to confirm it and see how much faster it is, well, it's, it's actually kind of hard to find uh, because, it's, uh, because it's small. And let's see, here it is down here. Uh, 12 milliseconds sure beats the heck out of 400 milliseconds. Does exactly the same thing, right? And this is something that could have puzzled me for days had I not been guided by a tool to sort of show, you know, that there was a problem and where the problem was. In fact, you'll notice that the strange thing is after I went and changed this code, no layout actually occurs in this event. In fact, the layout occurs after the fact, after this event is completely finished the uh, browser does layout. Now, that may seem strange to you, uh, so let me show you a quick example that, that illustrates what's going on here. I, I told you before that browser vendors are always trying to make things lazy. Um, so they're trying to make things lazy because, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an issue with the APIs inside the browser. Um, at any point, you can ask for the width of something, and you may actually change that width as you go, you know, or you may change the styles. And what they try to do is they try not to lay everything out for you every time you change something because that would be silly. If, they, you know, if you happen to be changing five class names in a row, then they don't want to update all the layout every time you change something, so they try to be sneaky. They try to wait until you read something 
that needs the layout information before they do the layout. But that can actually, uh, that can actually um, get you in trouble because if you're, if you're constantly reading things that, have, that cause layout, at the same time that you're setting things that invalidate that layout information, you start causing this pattern that we've been referring to as layout thrashing. Sort of a simple example here that I hope illustrates it, right? Uh, two lines, you're setting a class name and you're taking the width. Now, the top one is, the top one is going to be uh, a, lot, uh, a lot slower than the bottom one simply because I forced some layout which I then immediately just threw away. Um, I may not have even needed uh, that, that width at the same time. And, it's, and, you know, browsers try to be smart about certain subtrees of the DOM and, you know, invalidating only parts of the tree. But because of some of the, um, because of, you know, some of the ways the DOM tree works, it's actually, it's actually quite hard. And, you know, it can be surprising uh, invalidating something on one part of the DOM can actually have ripple effects in other parts of the UI. So this was a very surprising result to us. Um, we've run into it time and time again. And it is actually a hintlet inside of uh, Speed Tracer. And you probably saw that when we looked at that, uh, when I expanded the, the tree for that first one, you saw it was offering a hintlet to tell you that you had a lot of layout activity and it very much looked like one of these cases where you were thrashing the layout. Okay, so let's um, switch to our next example here, which uh, we call the mysterious case of too much data. Now there's no one app I can blame this one on. Um, this actually has happened quite a bit. It's, a, it's an age-old question when you're doing uh, web applications which have, you know, talk to a server, it's sort of classic client-server model, figuring out what to send from the server, um, when, right? I don't, you know, I, I cannot, obviously I can't get my app up fast and load my entire database into the client side, uh, and I also don't want to fetch every little piece of data every time it's needed, so there's a nice balancing act from getting the right amount of data to the front end at just the right time. So, and uh, for this example, I actually reused, um, I actually reused, it was just some, uh, an, a piece of code I had laying around. The reason I had it laying around is because it's the way I explained that, uh, why I moved from Boston to Atlanta. Um, so you'll notice when I hit load everything, and all this thing did was it fetched all the weather stations um, in the US and it just sort of plotted them on a canvas, right? So we're seeing all the weather stations in the US. Um, it, unsurprisingly, it kind of looks familiar when you just sort of draw them on a canvas, right? Um, but the reason why I like this app is because it shows why I moved from Boston. You notice the low ends of the graph here and went to Atlanta. Ooh, notice the nice ends of the graph that correspond with the winners. Those are actually the uh, temperatures uh, for the year 2009. So much warmer in Atlanta. But to show you again, and I'm going to open Speed Tracer this time uh, so we can get a sense of uh, how long things actually take. I'm going to hit the, I'm going to clear this and I'm going to hit load everything again. Now this is loading everything, as it says. I'm loading, you know, not only positions for all the weather stations, but I'm also loading all that data for 2009. Now, I feel justified in doing this because I'm over a fast connection and, uh, you know, it's probably going to get cached and this is sort of a limited purpose uh, um, application anyway. I'm mostly just showing it to, um, in, you know, presentations like this. Um, and so, you know, in fact, if I go to the network and I look at how long it took to fetch over the network, it was actually pretty fast. I mean, you know, it didn't take that long. It was, uh, you know, total, it was less than a second to fetch the data. Now, the surprising thing is that while it was uh, less than a second to fetch the data, actually parsing the data because it was JSON was half a second, right? So, you know, even if it was cached, I still have to sustain a half a second of the UI being locked up, right? And this is just, you know, simple JSON structure. I mean, it's like, you know, a, a list of objects that contain lists, right? It's not, not really that complex. <clears throat> so the other thing I want to use with this example is I want to demonstrate a feature of Speed Tracer. Now, if I expand this, You'll notice that Speed Tracer is shamefully not doing very well here. It's just telling me I ran a bunch of JavaScript. It's saying you ran a bunch of JavaScript and it took a long time. Well, that's not really helpful for a developer, right? I mean, I, I really need what I had on the last example, which is for you know the Speed Tracer to point out a particular line for me to fix. We're currently working on that. We're going to continue to add instrumentation and hopefully get there. But in the meantime, you need a way out if you get stuck. Um, so. 
I want to show you your way out. Let me clear this and show you a piece of code. Now you can imagine when the data comes back over the network, this does a couple of things. It parses the JSON and then it renders. Now, I, this is another one where I fooled myself and I said clearly the problem is that, you know, it's taking a long time to draw this stuff to Canvas, you know, and then it's not the case. And I've already sort of tipped this off. But, but the main thing I want to point out is I've added some lines here. I've uh, done console.mark timeline and I've passed a string. Now this, uh, this is basically a way to put additional information into Speed Tracer's tree. So every time I do this console.mark timeline, I'm basically telling Speed Tracer, okay, take this string and wherever it happened in the timing, just embed that string so I can find these points in the tree, right? So let me show that, show you that. I'm gonna enable the logging and we're gonna load everything again. Go back to Speed Tracer, zoom all the way out so I can see the, the new data all the way over here on the right. And again, zoom in. Um, and again, 448 milliseconds, pretty long. But you'll notice this time, instead of just being a big uh, blob of JavaScript, I also have these logs in here, which correspond directly to the strings that I, I put in, that you saw in the code. Um, and in fact, you'll also notice that there is a little blue uh, icon over here on the event itself. So you can actually use the smart timeline to actually find, particularly if you have a, a, a app that uses a lot of timers, it's often very hard to actually find the event you're looking for. Console at mark timeline is a great way to actually find what you're looking for. Um, and so you see the, you see the strings here um, that I had in the code. Now a trick that not many people know about is if I want to know the difference but, uh, in time from any two nodes in the tree, I can use uh, a little hidden feature, which is on Windows I do uh, control click, on Mac I do command click, and it'll tell me the time difference between these two nodes. So it's pretty clear that the problem now is parsing JSON, not the rendering. Parsing JSON was about 360, 360 milliseconds. Um, this was you know, doing the rendering only about 45 milliseconds. And it's also not surprising uh, with all that information that the fix for this was simply to just not load everything. So rather than loading all the data for 2009 for all the stations up front, I just wait and load that weather data on demand. So let's try the other strategy here, the load as needed. It, it came up a lot faster, which you probably already noticed, and of course, it works just the same. But let's go back and confirm what we saw Oops. inside of Speed Tracer. Again, uh, I'll actually use a since I keep zooming out, let me just move over here this time. And uh, yeah, 50, 56 milliseconds this time, a lot better. Parsing the JSON just by dropping those, uh, those arrays from each of the different elements, it goes down to a whole 28 milliseconds. So much, much better. So, so those are two examples that I hope show you, you know, sort of, uh, there's sort of scenarios that, that show you how you can use Speed Tracer to, to conquer real world stuff, not just sort of taking you on a tour of the UI, it actually shows you, you know, simplified playbacks of what we've done in our own performance investigations. So now, let me get back to my slides. I wanna talk about new features. Um, I'm gonna show you three new features. Uh, two of them are in uh, what we're calling our milestone, which is if you're going now in your seat and you're downloading Speed Tracer, um, or you already have it installed and you just noticed a new version arrived, that is the milestone. So up for download right now is the milestone that will have two of these features in it. The third one we're still experimenting, experimenting with, but it'll be available soon. Of course, we're open source, so if you're really interested, you can grab it now out of the source uh, repository. So the first thing, and I, I've, I gave this away early. Um, the number one requested feature was that people said, um, can you please show me the line of code that's causing the problem? Now, obviously, when I did the case of too much layout, I, I already showed you this, right? We jumped right to the line of code. So I'm not gonna show you that again. Instead, I'm gonna say we, we, took it a little bit, we took it a little bit further in some cases. So for people who are doing GWT code, they write in Java, right? And in fact, when you jump to that line of JavaScript code, it's not pretty. I mean, it, it's really hard to make sense of it. We, we actually wanted to jump back to the line of Java code. So, uh, you know, and people laughed and they said, yeah, 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 take us back to the line of Java code. And we weren't quite sure how to do that. And so we kind of laughed along with them. But we, we finally figured something out. And, and let me show you what we figured out. So I'm gonna, um, 
this is an application. If you use the App Engine, the Java SDK on App Engine, you're probably familiar with this uh, particular application. It's actually one of the samples. Um, and um, and I, I am, I'm going to use Speed Tracer on it. But the way I launched this one was instead of just sort of going to the application, um, going to the application and then you know, bringing Speed Tracer up on it, I actually used a new feature that's part of the uh, Google Eclipse, uh, Google plugin, uh, Google Eclipse plugin. Um, or Google plugin for Eclipse, I'm sorry. Um, so you'll notice in their new version that there is now a new menu item that I can say profile as speed tracer. Okay, I've already run this because you know I didn't obviously since you want to run in production mode, it runs the Go compiler. I don't want you guys to wait on that on stage. So I already have it running for us over here. I'm gonna open speed tracer, make it full screen. Return back here, and I'm simply going to refresh this guy just so we can get some data. Now, I hear Sticky was written by somebody who has just mad front end skills, so it's really fast. I wrote it. Um, and uh, I'm going to zoom in on the, the little bit of data we have, and I'm going to focus in on this uh, XML HTTP request because that looks like some interesting data. And now I look, and there's some parse HTML, and uh, I'm going to you know, again, I want to look at the line of code that caused this, and, and if I want to look at the JavaScript, then, you know, I can look at the JavaScript, and it's about as intelligible as I thought it was going to be. It's highly obfuscated. But you also notice there's something new for this particular trace. Right underneath the line of code for JavaScript is, hopefully you can read that, is a Java identifier. Um, if, you're, if you've written Google Web Toolkit front-end code, you recognize this, Google, uh, com.google gwit user client UI image. Um, you've, you're probably familiar with this. Um, and if I click on this link, then I actually go right into Eclipse. So. So, so hopefully that helps. Um, I, I know that many people have, have not enjoyed looking at the obfuscated JavaScript. We thought that jumping directly into the IDE would probably be a, uh, suitable for people who you know, are really attached to their tools like Eclipse, as we are. Okay, so <clears throat> the next feature, um, which you probably saw if you, uh, if you stayed for the whole uh, keynote, is um, server-side profile tracing. So we had a lot of people who, who they said, well, I've, you know, I've, I've worked on my front-end code, and it's really fast, but I still have this slow section, and it's the server, so, you know, the server guy hopefully will eventually take care of it, um, but I don't know what's going on. And they said it would be really cool if uh, Speed Tracer could just tell me what was going on in the server, could show me you know, the traces for what happened on the server. We thought that was a great idea as well. And so I'm going to show you this particular example on App Engine. So we've taken Sticky, uh, the sample app, we've deployed it to App Engine. And I've turned on uh, app stats, uh, which is a, a new feature inside of App Engine that, that tells you what happens you know, inside, of App Engine, inside of App Engine as you run your application, much of the way Speed Tracer shows you what happens inside the browser when you run your, the front end part of your application. Now I'm going to open Speed Tracer. And uh, let's go back here and do something. Maybe. type something in here, maybe move something around. All of these are causing writes back to the uh, App Engine. So it's telling the uh, data store to save the position of the sticky and to update the contents. And I'm going to go back to Speed Tracer. And I'm going to zoom all the way out and go to the network panel. You'll, you'll notice that some of these, or in fact, all of these, now have a, a special icon beside them that indicates that in addition to knowing how long things took and the HTTP request headers that are in there, it also has additional information about what happened on the server. And if I click on one of these, it'll actually fill in with a trace that came uh, directly from App Engine. And if you've used App Engine, you recognize these names. This is a get from the data store. We began a transaction, did another get, did a put, committed the results, and then deleted something from memcache. And in fact, that's when I updated something, so it, in, it uh, ended up invalidating my 
uh, invalidating my cache, so the next time, or invalidating my memcache, so the next time I actually had to do a bunch of queries to get everything instead of just pulling it out of memcache. Um, so we think this is really cool to be able to see the full story um, from you know, the client side all the way back into the server and just really get a sense for what is taking a long time regardless of whether it's the browser or um, you know, the back end, ser uh, the back end uh, serving infrastructure. And the other thing about this is it's available in two exciting flavors. Um, for App Engine, which I just showed you, is based on app stats. Uh, there is actually a talk, sadly it's going on right now, but there's a talk here at Google I.O. Uh, about app stats, if you're interested in that part. And, um, and the other is, as part of our work with Spring Source, uh, if you're a user of their uh, TC Server Developer Edition, they have a tool called Spring Insight, which, which has similar statistics for their, uh, for their stack, and Speed Tracer works there as well. So you can get these, uh, if, you're, if you're using that container as well, you can get these traces right up in Speed Tracer. Okay, so those are the two things that are contained in the milestone that you can download right now. Um, the next thing, um, the next thing is we're still working on, but we're actually quite excited about. Now, you uh, often work very hard to get your performance down. You spend about two weeks or so, and you're trying to get the performance in your web application just as tight as possible, and then you get it fast, and you celebrate, and you go out for beers, and then at some unspecified time later, you realize that it's no longer fast again because somebody committed something. Somebody didn't know about the excessive layout thing. They weren't looking at it with Speed Tracer all the time. They committed something. And all that work you've done is now out the window. And not only that, you're stuck with a window of some number of revisions that you now have to do a binary search on to figure out exactly what broke it. So we, teams kept telling us, I really just wish, you know, so I worked really hard to remove the, uh, a lot of the layout out of the start of my application. I wish every time somebody put something in that it automatically ran Speed Tracer on it and can tell me if the layout went up again. So we thought that was a pretty good idea as well. And so we were like, well, okay, what do we need? What do we actually need? Well, really all we need is a headless Speed Tracer, watches your application while it runs in your continuous build, and then sends those, those results somewhere for analysis. So we built the headless speed tracer, um, and now what we're doing is we're testing on some, uh, some internal applications, and we're trying to figure out the right formula for a dashboard. I'll give you sort of an inside peek on where we are with the dashboard. This is actually an internal application we've been monitoring, and we're trying to see if we can, we can actually see the regressions as they happen. Um, you know, and so we're, we're doing this. We're running their, uh, we have speed tracer and a continuous build for them. Um, it just sends all its data back to our dashboard, we do some analysis over it, and we just plot everything. And so we're, we're monitor it on an ongoing basis to see, to watch things uh, to see how things change. Uh, you know, we're monitoring a lot of different things at this point. One is the breakdown of what happened. I mentioned earlier, um, we, we've actually done a lot of exercises. Where we've just helped teams to remove layout, you know, this excessive layout from certain parts of their uh, applications, and. Um, they want to keep it out. They want it to stay fast. They won't want people, you know, accidentally checking something in that, that, that breaks all their hard work. So we sort of monitor the breakdown. If, uh, if we notice that the layout goes up, then obviously we should probably investigate that change list that went in that, that caused that to happen. You know, monitoring uh, other things, like I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with GWT's lightweight metrics. There's actually a system built into it that tells you uh, how long it took a module to load. We're monitoring this, that for the application as well. And, and a lot of other things. But, but the main thing is, is that you know, this will enable you to, to put Speed Tracer in your continuous build and start to actually analyze what's going on in your application as it runs as part of the build, which we think is, uh, is going to be pretty important. Okay, so the next thing I'll tell you is uh, go grab a copy of the milestone. It's, uh, it's available at this link. I'm sure the link is going to be in the, uh, in the wave. We actually have some Googlers taking notes. Uh, so important facts like this will be in there. And uh, I'm happy to take a few questions. While, while I take questions, I'm gonna leave the slide up. It's my contact information. Some additional Speed Tracer uh, URL. Speed Tracer is a open source project and that bottom link is actually directly to um, the open source uh, source repository, uh, uh, Google Code. And finally, a reminder that we're gonna be taking notes inside of Google Wave. Now I'm gonna, I, 
I'm going to just do live questions during this part, but if you've put a question in moderator, I'm just gonna answer it throughout the day so we can continue to talk there. I hope that's okay. But I decided to, to just field the questions for the people in the room uh, while people are in the room. That way I can actually answer more questions than I could if I tried to handle moderator you know, while on stage. So uh, thank you guys, and I'm happy to field questions now. Oh, and please use the mic. Please use the mic for questions uh, so that we're going to actually be recording. So I want to make sure that your question is on, uh, is, you know, on the audio. I have a question about the example you have with Java, uh, going back to Java line. Uh -huh. But what can you do at that point? Because you know, I think there's another abstraction um, with, with Java. How, how do you know how it translates into JavaScript? Um, maybe that's hidden from you. Do you yeah. have to do, do you have to write JavaScript and then interface with GWT? Right, so, um, so it's a good question. And actually I found there's a big, uh, one of the other advantages that I didn't even mention of this is, you saw that I clicked on the link first that brought up the JavaScript, and then I clicked on the link that brought up the Java. Now it turns out that that's actually really powerful in itself because you often want to ask the question, what did the GWT compiler do for me? And it just turns out to be a really convenient way to answer that question because you can actually bring up the JavaScript inside a speed tracer and bring it up in an IDE. And obviously on your workstation, you typically have more than the 1024 by 768 that I have here. So you can bring them up side by side. And it actually helps to answer that question in an efficient manner because otherwise you would have to look at the Java code and then you have to open the JavaScript code in an editor and then you would have to find the function that you're looking for. Well, this, this allows a you know, much quicker uh, way to compare them side by side. So we, often, we actually often use that quite a bit to, to figure out exactly what the uh, GWC compiler is doing. So. Yeah. I have a oh, sorry, over here. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question about the server tracing feature, because you said it was compatible with App Engine and Spring Source. Mm -hmm. Is there any documentation on the kind of data you need to get back from the server to be able to display it in Speed Tracer? There is, uh, there is not currently uh, anything besides our source repository, but there is about to be. Okay. Um, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, it turns out that uh, the event trace that we show um, for, the, uh, for what's going on inside the browser is exactly the sort of uh, nested data structure you want for the server. The only thing that sort of confounds it is if you're using multiple threads, um, and we haven't really handled that case um, quite yet. But, you know, it's, you basically just end up creating a JSON structure that has this, this, uh, this sort of tree appearance. Um, it's, uh, you know, and we're gonna, at some point after I.O., we're actually gonna get the data at least published to the open source group while we continue to tweak on it. But, um, but yeah, it's pretty simple JSON format. Okay, so thanks. Look for that to show up soon. It's actually the same question. I oh, cool, <laughs> awesome. And, and also, if you, if you have server-side tools that you wanna make this work with, you know, feel free to, to uh, we have uh, their Speed Tracer uh, dev Google group. Feel free to email that group and, you know, we'll, we'll help you get to where you need to be, so. All right, so uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm not sure if this falls under the realm of Speed Tracer, but uh, it's about profiling. Um, what happens is most of the developers are running uh, Speed Tracer on a faster machines than your end user would. And uh, is there any uh, uh, direction that you can pr create profiles and do caps on CPU or memory and uh, get a more realistic profile rather than uh, a little skewed from a developer's point of view? Yeah, that's, it's a great idea. We're interested in it. We haven't really done, uh, we haven't really done much in that, um, you know, in that realm. But I think it's an absolutely great idea. I mean, for instance, particularly if you could use, um, you know, if you could use things we know about um, the breakdown of users and their machines, that would be even better. Right. Um, and uh, to say things like, oh, well, this event ran fine for you, but, you know, on this particular uh, demographic, it's not going to run well. I mean, there are a lot of great ideas. I don't, um, obviously, we haven't done anything yet, but I think something like that would be really cool. Thank you. I was just wanting to ask about the uh, developer plugin for Chrome. Yep. For Mac OS, do you know if any news on that? The uh, the developer. So you can run the code server and then run Chrome and Mac OS and use Speed Tracer against that. I don't know. I mean. Oh, oh, you mean for Chrome OS? Or yeah. For, oh. Um, no. Uh, sorry, for Mac OS. Oh, Mac OS for yeah. Mac OS on Chrome or? Yeah. 
Um, the Gwit developer plugin, so you can. Oh, oh, oh! You mean the uh, the the when you're actually running inside of development mode? Yeah. Do yeah. Okay. Um, so um, yes, the uh, we still don't have a plugin for Mac, as you've pointed out, for Mac Chrome, right? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know when that's coming. Bruce, do you know? Is Bruce still in the room? Does it, I don't know. If you email me, I can find out. I, I, um, I got kind of detached from what's going on with development mode, but, uh, um, but I can find out for you. I think it's, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it. I'm just not sure when it's gonna come, uh, when it's gonna come about. Um, doing Speed Tracer in development mode obviously gives you a lot of misleading uh, results, but, um, but yeah, uh, development mode for Chrome on the Mac is desperately needed. Uh, uh, Linux as well. Hi, thank you for thank your talk. You. I was curious about your last feature, if, anyone, if you know of anyone developing a Hudson plugin for, uh, for that. You mean the headless? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the only place that, that exists right now is in, uh, in the source control repository for Speed Tracer. Um, so if you're interested in it, feel free to grab it, compile it, try it out yourself. We're open source project, so if you want to contribute back, it's awesome. What we're really trying to do with that right now is we know that uh, we, know that we want this thing in the continuous build. But it's actually so much data to analyze, we're trying to figure out exactly the sort of things that we're gonna wanna look, on, look at on an ongoing basis. And so we're still trying to sort of simplify the reams of data. So, to, so if there's anybody who wants to help out you know, and wants to sort of try it out, the more, da uh, more data we can get about you know, what sort of things people want to see, the easier it will be to, to get to something more you know, faster that, uh, that is actually simple enough to, to use on, you know, on a daily basis in your continuous build. So. Um, thanks for GWT and Speed Tracer. It's freaking awesome. Um, but uh, with the mark timeline in the console, is there anything in GWT, or is that would just be a native method that you're just passing in a string to at the present? Right now, it's just to create a, a JS9 method yeah. and call it directly. Yeah. Um, there's actually some talk about doing something a little um, a little more clever. In fact, we've uh, I'm I'm. I made a pitch to add uh, console mark timeline into all the widgets that you could turn on in a permutation so that you get like full traces of when things happen. Yep. Um, so something like that's gonna happen soon. But right now, just call it as a native method. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Sure. So uh, first of all, thank you for that uh, connection to the Java code. That was by far my biggest awesome. pony request. Like I scrolled out half of my complaints as soon as awesome. you got to that that's point. Cool. Um, Maybe a couple more kind of pony requests here. Um, so knowing the line of code that caused the problem is nice, but if you profile like in an all Java stack, use a profiler, generally you record and then you stop recording yep. and you kind of get times per method. And Speed Tracer doesn't work that way, I'd assume, because maybe browsers don't really work that way. It's a lot right. of callbacks and stuff, but it's kind of hard to correlate like that this code took a lot of time as opposed to, oh, this is just the entry to the code that maybe took a lot of time. Is there a way that Speed Tracer can sort of help us find those hotspots? Yes, stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're actually, um, Eric, who's ducking his head out there in the audience. Wait, raise your head, Eric. Raise your hand, Eric. So Eric is actually working on some, uh, some st uh, integration with a, uh, with a conventional JavaScript debugger, which, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of technical work to be done for that. You know, of course, everything we do, we, we sort of work with Chrome and WebKit teams to, to figure out um, the best way to do it. So we're, we're actually doing that right now with integration uh, with the profiler. The, the thought is, is that what we would do is, in, in addition to having that sort of event stream, mm -hmm. you could click on any event and actually get a profile for that particular event. Right, so it's awesome. actually still organized in the way that Speed Tracer likes to organize things, but you, you get all the information that you would have in a, in a regular JavaScript profiler. So. And then one maybe tiny pony request, as a, and maybe just your expertise. Um, sometimes I'm afraid that we lose a lot of time. Um, uh, we deliver big payloads, um, JSON payloads, and we gzip them because we want to, you know, adhere to best practices and try to make it as small as possible. And Sometimes I'm afraid that the browser is taking a long time to ungzip them. If, right. if you have something that uh, goes to 100K and then it ungzips to four megs, uh, that seems like that should take some time, but I could never find any indication of how long that is possibly taking. Right. Um, is that an event that I could look at? Or? So we don't have it as an event. Uh, and, and I have to say that uh, 
my experimentation here is pretty small, but yeah. I have what I, I, ha I will tell you that I observe, from what I've observed, it's insignificant. Okay. The reason okay. why it's insignificant, uh, in addition to just not taking a lot of total time, is that most browsers actually have additional threads or in some cases additional processes that are part of the resource loading stack. So in most cases, it doesn't even happen on your UI thread. Right. So even if it did take a little bit of time, it still has that asynchronous uh, feel you know, apart from the actual UI. So and the uh, native, so, oh, sorry. Sorry, and the native JSON parsing, do you think that that's gonna help with the payload delivery? Or are you, is that timing that you're looking at already native browser JSON timing? It's, or, so um, the native parsing of JSON in the browsers is, uh, is considerably faster than what we have been doing. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's gonna actually get faster though. I, I've already heard some discussion right, uh, about you. it uh, being faster. So we're gonna run out of time. I'm, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down my stuff and I'm gonna head towards the back so that as the next session comes in, um, where I'm not standing up in the front. And if you have a question that you wanna ask me, then, then meet, me, meet me back there. Cool. Thanks, everyone.